Okay, um, welcome everyone. So since it's uh, already the starting time of today's webinar, um, I'm the host of this event and uh, we will we will kickstart. And for any attendee who is not a panelist, please mute your phone or your laptop. Thank you very much. So um, greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to first thank you all for attending today's international series webinar of Investing in China 2023 about QFI participation in Chinese deri derivatives market hosted by us, Nanhua Futures, together with DBS Bank. And here is also the special thank to our co-organizer, Shanghai Futures Exchange, for this incredible event. Today, we're honored to have five panelists, each from DBS, Shafi, and Nanhua. For any questions you may have during this event, please type in the chat and do remember to mention which question, which this question goes to. Okay, so first let's welcome Ian Jin from DBS China to have the um, opening introduction. Welcome, Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you and to those who are joining us outside of the Asian continent, good morning to you. On 2nd of September, 2022, China's futures exchanges finally announced the easing of rules allowing foreign investors to invest in the derivatives market via QFI channel. And as of today, foreign investors can access to 27 futures and 18 options contracts in China's futures exchanges. And with this easing of the rules, we have also seen an increase in the number of foreign investors applying QFI and also the number of approvals um, that happened in the last second quarter of 2022. As of end December, 2022, there were 72 successful Q3 applications, of which 29 were approved in the last quarter itself. And with CSI 300 increasing 6.9% year to date and January 2023 as compared to end December 2022, and S&P 500 increased 6.6% .6 over the same period. What does that mean for the China capital markets? And generally, economies do expect U.S. to further increase the interest rates, as recent incident incidents have told us. But China finally feel the inflationary pressure that the rest of the world went through in the past 24 months. Without further delay, let me pass on the baton to my next speaker, Mr. Nathan Chow. Nathan joined DBS in 2011 and is currently a senior economist specializing in macro economic sport for Greater China. He regularly conducts interviews through various media, providing DBS views on finance and economics. As get a guest speaker, he also le delivers lectures on MBA courses at University of Hong Kong and the Chinese University of Hong Kong. In his presentation, Nathan will be sharing DBS view on China macroeconomic outlook, as well as the bank's forecast for key commodities prices in the near future. And following that, we have Ms. Yi Ping Yang of Shanghai Futures Exchange, who will share across the investment opportunities in the global derivatives market now that China has opened up. And thereafter, Ms. Mara Wang of Nanhua Futures will explain access to China futures derivatives via the QV route, followed by my team member, Ms. Iris Gao, who will go through the QV application process and the services DBS offers as a QV custodian. We trust you have enjoyed this seminar and please feel free to send through your queries towards the end of this presentation. Over to you, Nathan. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so I think the timing of today's webinar is very good because uh, for the macro section, we have just, uh, you know, we have recently upgraded our GDP projection for China. So long story short, we, um, believe the outlook for the Chinese economy this year is going to be brighter uh, compared to last year based on two factors. One of them is the uh, government's pivot from uh, zero COVID policy. And the other one is the major uh, policy shift, including the property market. So all of this will uh, definitely provide a brighter outlook. And you know, not only to China, but also for countries that depend on Chinese spending. All right, so uh, let's, move, let's move on to the first slide. Uh, so on the first slide, I have 
I have put up a roadmap showing the entire path of the economic recovery this year for China. So basically what happened in the past two months is that we, we were kind of in the middle of an, um, we called it inevitable adjustment phase because of the uh, shift in zero COVID policy, right? So that's why over the past two months, most of the economic activities were um, kind of weak, right? Uh, but the good news is that uh, based on some high frequency data such as uh, subway, such as traffic, uh, almost for sure that the pandemic situation in major cities have already peaked. And uh, we have also seen some green shoots over the Chinese New Year holiday. You know, people are dining out, taking tours, uh, you know, movie box office get uh, great numbers as well as hotel bookings and those prelim uh, tourism revenues, all of them, like most of them are showing very good numbers, right? So uh, although the, uh, I would say the infection rate in rural areas may remain kind of high in the near term. But the big picture here is that the whole economy is, you know, finding its footing. Okay, so major activities will continue to recover going forward. And both fiscal and monetary policy will uh, continue to support the uh, recovery. Okay, so this is the major reason, you know, the uh, Chinese government pivot from zero COVID policy is the major reason why we have revised up our GDP projection this year to 5.5%. Before, uh, like earlier, we have uh, we had we had 3%, but right now we have upgraded to 5.5%. As shown on next slide, I have also put up a table uh, on, on next slide to show you the forecast numbers from major institutions, including the IMF. Next slide, please. On this, on, on yeah, on the second slide, you can see the projections, including ours. Yeah, yeah. Here you go. Uh, so, you know, the, just like what I said, the government's pivot from zero COVID policy is the major reason. Another important uh, important reason for our, uh, you, you know, uh, up upgrading is the policy shifts since uh, later last year. And you know the numbers, you know the, the the economic indicators may not show that much yet, but uh, it is quite obvious that uh, the tone has clearly changed. If we listen to some of the major speeches delivered by the uh, senior officials, like uh, right, uh, so particularly the Central uh, Economic Work Conferences held in December. December uh, you know, that reflects a far more, not just pro-growth stance, but also a far more friendlier stance towards the private sector. The tone is totally different from the past two years, and some of the actions are quite frankly as well. Um, I, I mean, are, are quite frankly different as well. So, for instance, they have said that, um, you know, the uh, ratification of the platform companies is now over. Doesn't mean it's not going to be any regulation, but it is going to be a more normal uh, regulatory process, right? So, for, for example, Didi Chusing, right? Didi Chusing was allowed to take on new users on their platform. For more than two years, they couldn't do that. So, there is definitely some positive signals there, right? And, uh, you know, a lot of examples. Another one would be, uh, you know, the approval. Uh, granted to 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 new uh, to platform companies to raise new capital, and you know granting more game licenses to you know Tencent and NetEase, you know etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is sort of the new policy direction under the new team that uh, President Xi Jinping has put in place, and you know the formal transition of the new team will be completed by March, and then will properly seem. Uh, will be will properly see more uh, evidence of a change in policy direction by then. Okay, uh, and and actually there is already some tangible development. If we look at uh, next slide, please, we can already see some positive signals. For instance, on this slide here, we can see corporate long-term loans, uh, which have improved quite notably in the last couple of months. Right. So in December, for instance, long-term corporate loans rose to 
as much as 1.2 trillion renminbi, right? So we are talking about like uh, 250 percent growth on year on year basis. So the jump has a lot to do with the policy shift, uh, policy shift that we just have discussed. Uh, majorly come from the policy support for the financing of housing project delivery. Okay, and you know, speaking of uh, 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 you know property market, actually there is quite a big change in regulators' attitude toward the uh, property sector. For instance, the government has started to. Uh, emphasize that the sector is an important pillar of the economy, right? And also the regulators uh, uh, rolled out a lot of measures to boost developers' funding. For instance, uh, asking banks to extend more loans and they have also lifted ban on equity refinancing so that the listed developers right now uh, are able to issue shares. Okay, so all of this will help to, you know, cushion the uh, property developers repayment pressure in the near term. And, you know, for sure the sentiment is improving. Uh, if we look at the slide on the chart on next slide, please. I have put up a, a, a chart here on next slide, which is our DBS China property offshore bond price index. So which has started to rebound since December last year. Okay. And uh, we have also we have also seen some big developers. Uh, they have started to raise fund again in the offshore market. You know, many of those have been absent from the market for quite a while, but recently they have uh, 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 you know, started to raise fund again in the offshore market to raise, for instance, dollar bond, uh, uh, you know, raise fund from issuing dollar bond. Okay, and uh, some developers were also able to secure more credit lines from commercial banks, which is another uh, positive development. And if we look at the credit market, uh, the spreads for uh, uh, investment grade uh, continue to narrow, which is another good sign, right? So in general, what I'm trying to say is that uh, property developers operating cash flows in 2023 will gradually improve, meaning there will be less defaults. Unlike last year, we have seen a lot of default, a lot of bad news last year, right? But going forward, uh, things are gonna be better, okay? Based on the policy, uh, based on the policy development, all right? But uh, what is interesting is that so far, uh, as you can see on, this, uh, on, on the chart here, so far the share prices, the bond prices, for most developers have only recovered to the levels that we've seen in August or September last year, right? So, which means most of them are still like 60% or 70% below the peak that we've seen in 2021, right? So it is sort of suggesting that uh, confidence is improving, but has not fully recovered, recovered yet, right? And so, I, I, I think what market need, what investors need is to see a real pickup in home purchases, which is still very weak right now. Okay, so my, my, my take is that going forward in the near term, the physical housing market in China is still going to be soft, uh, at least in the next couple of months, because uh, COVID has, in fact, done quite a disruption to the economy and the job market in China. And uh, those people uh, who want to buy houses, they might want to wait and see if local government will give more incentives to attract sales. So uh, because over the past few months, if we have paid attention to the, to, to, uh, to the market, you know, some uh, local governments have offered subsidies, some have lowered uh, mortgage rates, you know. So as an investor, or a home buyer, they might want to wait and see uh, uh, see if local government, government will give more incentives, right? Uh, so that's why uh, I would uh, I, I would say uh, in the next couple of months the housing market will continue to be kind of soft, right? But uh, what we learn from uh, the previous cycles is that like the one in 2011 and the one in 2013, usually. Uh, supportive policies take 
uh, like six to eight months to be reflected into the physical market. So it makes sense to expect the property sales, uh, the property market to have a more uh, meaningful turn in some time, you know, the third quarter of this year. Okay, sometimes in the third quarter of this year. I'm not saying there will be a super V-shaped rebound, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that we'll be seeing more stabilization in terms of uh, housing transaction, home sales, and even home prices this year in you know, the third quarter of this year. Okay, uh, so this is my, you know, my thought about the property market in China. And as long as the consumption is concerned, um, there will be a rebound in the near term, just like what I have pointed out at the very beginning of the presentation uh, based on the high frequency uh, 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 indicators, right? So full year growth rate for uh, retail sales for this year will be around like eight to 9%. Okay, way better, way better than the 1% contraction uh, in 2022. All right, we're gonna see eight to 9% rebound in uh, 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 retail sales, but it also reflects a low base for, uh, for sure, right? Okay, so on, on a two year average basis, it would be something about 4%. Well, it is still below the 8% that we've seen in the pre-COVID years and the reason why I'm a bit modest in my expectations is that there is still uh, quite a lot of uncertainty out there, right? If we move on to next slide, I have put up two charts here. Uh, one of them is the income growth. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, income growth uh, in Chinese household. Okay, on the on the left. So right now, I mean, in 2022, income growth per capita was 2.9% is way below that in uh, you know, the pre-COVID era, okay? The pre-COVID years, which was about like 6.7%, okay? So income growth is sort of, you know, kind of kind of slow compared to uh, 2019. And then if we look at the chart on the right, uh, households expectations of future income is still falling. They are kind of pessimistic. They are more pessimistic than they were in 2020, and also uh, uh, lower than you know during the global financial crisis. I mean, going forward, this expectation here, the index will uh, uh, rebound, of course, but it's you know this is going to take some time to go back to the normal level. Okay, uh, so. Uh, so based on this development against this backdrop, the savings rate of the Chinese household uh, may remain quite high for quite a while. For quite a while. So that's why, um, you know, yes, there will be a rebound in consumption, but not a super strong one. Okay. Uh, so this is my take about, uh, you know, the consumption market and externally, uh, it doesn't look too good, frankly speaking, because, uh, next slide please, because most of the, uh, 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 the rest of the world, especially the US and Europe uh, slowing down, right? Uh, so on the right here, you see our growth projection for major economies, including China, including the US and Japan and Eurozone, right? So most of them are slowing down, okay? Uh, and the fact that inflation are uh, kind of high still in the US and, you know, so it, you know, inflation has been squeezing their household's disposable income, right? The latest CPI number uh, for the US just released days ago was higher than consensus again, and surfaces inflation is particularly sticky. So the upshot is that uh, it is too early to claim that the inflation battle is over especially in the US and Europe, okay? So inflation has been squeezing their household's disposable income. Uh, real wages have been falling over the past two years. So people are sort of tightening their bells. So external demand is not going to drive China very much. I think we can uh, agree on that, okay? So that's why against this backdrop, I would say investment growth is still gonna be very important, especially infrastructure investment in China, okay? Because it is still the most 
uh, controllable way to boost the, 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 the Chinese economy, and it is also beneficial for future growth. And it is not just about infrastructure investment. Uh, it also supports consumption as well, because infrastructure investment is, is, is strongly correlated with income growth of migrant workers in China. Okay, uh, so I think bonds this year to 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 somewhere around like 3.7 and 3.8 trillion because local government special bond is a very crucial funding source for infrastructure projects okay so uh, the chance is high for the government to raise the quarter uh, it it will be announced in the NPC meeting to be held in March very soon we're gonna know the answer okay so uh and on the monetary policy side, uh, next slide, please. The PBOC uh, monetary stands for the PBOC will remain supportive. They're gonna keep a funding cost low enough to facilitate the issuance of extra government bonds uh, uh, this year to finance the infrastructure projects. Uh, so the, the, you know, the good thing is that inflation is not a very huge problem in China. Uh, as you can see on the right chart here, uh, you know, the latest CPI number for China is just like 1.8%, right? Compared to 6.5 in the US, compared to 9.2 in the real zone, right? So inflation number is not that high in China. It's not a very uh, big concern. Uh, and the fact that the reopening will boost prices, yes, but partially offset by the uh, uh, retreat in global energy prices and raw material prices, okay? And China imports a lot of uh, uh, oil from Russia as well with some decent discounts, okay? So after taking all of this into consideration, I don't think inflation is gonna be a big problem uh, for the PPOC, okay? So the conclusion here is that uh, the PBOC will continue to be accommodative, uh, but you know, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying they will cut interest rate aggressively. Uh, you know, the economy will be healed by the reopening itself, and all of the previous rate cuts and tax breaks will gradually filter through. So the PBOC does not need to cut interest rates too much from this level. What I'm trying to say is that they will be able, if they want to, they can maintain. Uh, the interest rate at least at this level. They don't have to hike interest rate, just like what the Fed has been doing or you know, the ECB has been doing, okay? So, so this is the conclusion. I mean, uh, just like what I have said you know, all along, you know, the Chinese government's pivot from uh, zero COVID policy and the major policy shift will provide a brighter outlook this year, not only to China, but also for countries that depend on Chinese spending all right, and you know, for instance, hotels in Thailand, shopping malls in Hong Kong, and you know, exporters of the commodities that China consumers will, uh, uh, I mean, China consumes will also benefit, right? And speaking of commodities, I have put up a, a summary table on next slide to show our major uh, target prices for, uh, you know, metals. All right, the target prices for some major metals. Here we go, yeah. So, uh, so even though you can see the average price forecast uh, for 2023 for major metals are lower than 2022, but uh, we have to keep, in, keep, keep the fact in mind is that uh, they would have been even lower if it is not for China's reopening, okay? And we have to understand that 2022 uh, was a year with a high base. Uh, prices were sort of overshooting, especially in the first half of last year uh, because of the breaking uh, Russia and Ukraine war. Uh, there are a lot of supply chain issues. So we have a very high base in 2022, okay? And this year, uh, when we enter the second half uh, 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 in 2023, there will be higher supply growth as well. Uh, due to the commencing of new capacity. Uh, uh, so, I mean, so that's why after we will see a price 
uh, increase for most metals in the first half of this year. Uh, most of their prices will sort of, you know, uh, uh, heading down a little bit, moderate a little bit in the second half of this year. Okay, but overall, uh, metals like, you know, aluminum, copper, and steel are preferred to other metals because, uh, you know, we, we're going to understand that, for instance, metal and steel prices have been strongly correlated, correlated with macro indicators such as PMIs and OECD leading indicators. So, you know, the recovery of the Chinese economy, for instance, the Chinese uh, PMI will support metal prices going forward, at least in, in the first half of this year. And for instance, uh, uh, you know, the demand will be strong as well. For instance, copper demand, right? Copper demand is going to benefit from the cyclical and structural changes as well, because, you know, the, the China's reopening and relaxation of restrictions on the three red lines uh, uh, for the property market, you know, all of this development will boost demand for copper, right? And uh, on the structural front, uh, all of those high-tech infrastructure developments like 5G networks, uh, AI and data centers, all of them will boost demand for copper as well as the, you know, uh, you know rapid ex expansions of renewable energy capacity and the EV market, right? So uh, I would say the copper market is expected to re remain tight until, uh, 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 you know, the second half of this year, right? Because what we have just talked about is that in the second half of this year, uh, the market will turn to a sort of, you know, a surplus because of the strong supply growth in the mined and refined copper in the second half of this year. Uh, so the price increase in copper will mainly happen in the first half of uh, this year, okay? But, you know, because of the time constraint, I cannot go through every one of them here, but the general picture is that, uh, you know, most of the price increase will happen in the first half of this year and kind of moderate in the second half of this year. Okay, so uh, this brings me to the end of my presentation. We can share more uh, during the Q&A section. Thank you.